All right, you guys, welcome to week three. And I'll just pull up our syllabus here to remind us. I I had a question about Alex. Sure. So let's say um, I want to do the homework again. Will it erase my highest score or will it keep my highest score? It'll keep your highest score. Okay, so I can go back and redo it so I can study with it, right? You sure can. Um, you can also do the practice. So let me see. You know, the practice exam. So that might, you know, be helpful after you've done homework. Because everything's open. So... You can definitely go back and, you know, keep working on homework, but also like practice exam one is open, just saying. Because in there, you know, I've really tried to narrow down the questions that you need to know for the exam. All right, thanks for asking. And also, you know, just a little reminder here about this Alex pricing. You know, it is supposed to be $39.99. So they made a mistake. And I talked, I <laughs> I did a lot trying to get this sorted out last week. Um, so if you haven't purchased it yet, they extended that free financial aid access code time from 14 days. They extended it all the way through September 30th. So you don't need to pay for it yet. And when you do get around to paying for it, make sure you're only paying $39.99, okay? If you've paid more than that, email me the receipt and I'll forward it on to them and they've promised to refund the difference, okay? So probably $5 plus the tax or whatever. I don't know. I don't know about technical stuff, but um, yeah. All right. So chapter two is on graphical displays. You know, just as a reminder, in chapter one, we looked at sampling and data. And so this idea is that we wanna study a large population. It's too expensive, impractical, inconvenient, whatever, to study the entire population. So we take a sample, we collect that data. And now, once you've collected data, what will you do with it? Data can be described and presented in many different formats. And in chapter two, we're gonna study graphical ways to display data. So you're gonna learn how to create and how to interpret graphs. And I know we started looking a little bit um, in chapter one, like we did look at a line plot, the same as a dot plot, when we were plotting the average hours that we sleep per night, for example, we use that dot plotter. Um, so in Alex, they have a problem like this, constructing a line plot and then constructing a bar graph for categorical data or non-numerical data. So here's an example where ice cream at a restaurant comes in four flavors and there were 16 ordered on Tuesday and here they are, draw the bar graph and we're gonna see you know, like above lemon, you would be able to click and drag the bar up to whatever height you want. And the height corresponds to the frequency or how many. Okay, so there are four lemon, right? One, two, three, four. And so we would drag, I'm going to slide that over here. We can see the full question. Okay. 
Um, so we would drag this up to a height of four. And then there were one peanut butter, et cetera. All right, you could also make this little tally chart and then do the frequency. Um, we also looked a little bit at stem and leaf plots. And here's an example. This one has a key where one bar four means 14. Here's a link that also has some great examples at mathisfun.com. Stem and leaf plots. So this is also just a good reminder about this website, this resource. You know, I know, I feel like, you know, when we're doing math, we're working on a problem, we're so into that problem, we forget kind of all the different resources that are available to us. It's just like, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. Okay, so I'm trying to, you know, give you reminders. You can text me. We have free tutoring 24-7. We also have linked to our Canvas page a link to the Math is Fun site. Right from the home page, you go to this links and resources. Scroll down, and here we go. So there are other ones too. But just reminding you about this one. And it starts out, what is data? Discrete and continuous data, right? How to show data, bar graphs, pie charts, et cetera. And so right now we're looking at the stem and leaf plots. And they not only have examples and different explanations, but they also have little practice questions. So it's just kind of nice. I really like that website. They've done a great job, I think. Okay. So, all right, let's look at in Alex problems one through eight. And notice we have 31 problems for this week. That's not a lot, you guys. <laughs> if you did a few problems a day in seven days, right, you're doing like four, five problems a day. Again, I always think back in high school with the one through 50 odd. So, all right. The first one here is to draw a line plot for these numbers. So you grab the pencil, you've got the real number line here, and there's one for nine. So anywhere over the nine, you can click and it puts the X there. And then for the six, then we have two four. So you click twice, one seven, there's another nine, another six, an eight, a six, and a four. Okay. So that I think is pretty straightforward. Feel free to shout out any questions. Constructing a bar graph for non numerical data. A new model of shirt at the clothing store comes in five different colors. There were 13 shirts sold. Here they are by color. Draw the bar graph for these data. So you're just going to count how many gray were sold. One, is it just one? Mm -hmm. How many blue? One, two, three, four, five. You could do the tally chart if you want, how many red and so on, okay? All 
All right, so we have um, Sarah Mace here and from the Math Success Center, and she is going to talk to us about all the wonderfulness of the Math Success Center. So go ahead, Sarah, I'll pass it over to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to show you guys some Canvas. Um, if you guys haven't explored yet, it is under your um, school, like on the tab of this stats class. Another way to access it is through our website. So this is our main website. We have updated hours, our email, phone number, and here's a direct link to the Canvas. So our Canvas will look like this. We do have social media links, uh, Discord. It is new. Um, if you do sign up, I think it's wanting you to sign in with your student ID, uh, your student email, which is your ID at LBC. Um, sign into that. We do have platforms, so you can talk to STAT students that are um, through this school, not just in your classroom. We do have an instructor that monitors the platform to see if um, there's any questions that need to be answered. So it's still kind of in our like starting stages, but this is a Discord option for you guys. We do offer a walk-in tutoring, so just come to the math center with your photo ID. It doesn't have to be a school ID. It could be your driver's license, passport, just anything with your photo and a name. Um, say you're here for tutoring and we can assist you. It is a drop-in wait list. So to settle in your desk, we do have QR codes or a computer that you would sign in. And you'll just, um, every time you have like a question, just sign up for the wait list. A tutor will come to you, it's typically about 15 to 20 minute sessions, but you can always put yourself back on the wait list once you have another question for them. Um, if you do prefer a Zoom appointment, you would click this icon, fill out our appointment request. You would have to fill out this form if you are requesting a Zoom tutoring session. Make sure the email is up to date because we will be contacting you through email about any changes on the time and you're able to pick two time frames. Um, just be mindful that if you pick a time slot, make sure it's with a little more than 30 minutes prior, just so the front desk have enough time to see your email, make the Zoom link, and make sure the both the tutor and you are ready for the session. We do offer stat tutorials. So you'll just click on this stat tutorial sign up. These links are Forms. So once you fill out this form, you will be getting an automatic email with the Zoom link and the workshop um, printable like PDF. Just to keep a note that since they do start at 4.15, these forms close at 4 p.m. But if it's like 4.10 and you forgot to sign up, just give us a call or email us and we can quickly send you the Zoom link so you can join the session. We also have our resource library. So this is a good way to um, kind of explore other classes or go through your own. You guys have access to all of these tiles, doesn't matter what class you're in. We have a free textbook online as well as handouts, some self-paced interactive tutorials to do, printables, calculator, YouTube. So this is just a good way to study and it's all for you guys uh, any time of day. This is all in your Canvas. We also have NetTutor. So if our hours up here don't work for your tutoring um, and you have like a midnight question, you're working on homework, the school partnered up with NetTutor. So you'll just hit the tutoring center. You can scroll down. They offer tutoring in all these subjects. Hit stats. You can drop in with the live tutor, schedule an appointment with them. Or you can drop off a question and then check up with your Canvas later. Typically for stats, it's like 24 hours. So that's a good alternative if um, you want that late night tutoring or question. And we're going to be closed since our hours are closed at 7 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Friday, we're 9 to 3. And Saturdays, we're open from 11 to 4. Okay, we do have more contact links. And that's pretty much what's on the math center. Unfortunately, we're all out of our graphic calculators, but this would be the link to sign up for a contract. Um, 
So just in case you need a science tip at calculator or graphing calculator next semester, you know that this is would be the form that you need to fill out. Is there any questions? No? Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Thank All you. right. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thank you. thank you. Have a good night. You too. Yeah. All right. So great stuff, you guys. I hope you will take advantage of whatever you might need help with. All right. And next up, we have interpreting a bar graph. So a store sells t-shirts in six colors. Here they are. So we can see like number of t-shirts sold along this axis and the colors along this axis, right? So the bar right above the color correspond to each other. Um, and since this is, you know, categorical data, it's not a number line or anything. We just leave some space between each bar. All right, of which color were there the fewest t-shirts sold? What do you guys think? What color were the fewest t-shirts sold? Orange. Right, and it's really quick to see it's going to be the smallest bar in height. And so the height we can look off to the left corresponds to three, right? Which is that question, <laughs> how many of the orange were sold? And it looks like three. How many more white were sold than red? How many more white were sold than red? So there were 10 white, there were eight red. So how many more that means to subtract, right? And for how many colors were there at most six sold? So you look across here, at the mark for six, at the most. So that means six or less. So there were two colors, right? The blue and the orange. Okay. And then we can also interpret a double bar graph. You guys have probably seen these around too, just on TV and print on brochures or something. Let's see, Burns Corporation has four departments. The double bar graph below shows how many male and female employees are in each department. Use this graph to answer the question. So here, number of employees. And then down here are the departments. So in advertising, solid green gives you the number of males and the blue stripe gives you the number of females. So which department have more females than males? So we're gonna look at the blue stripe and we want this blue stripe to be higher than the green. And just advertising. Which department have more than 100 females? So now you're going to look at that 100 mark. And you want the, the ones where the blue stripe is above that 100 mark. So production and accounting. 
estimate the total number of employees in accounting. So there are 200 females. And, you know, how many males? Well, you know, halfway through would be 225, but that looks more like maybe 230, 235. It ought to accept, you know, either one. <laughs> so we add them together and we get, let's try 430 and see if it accepts that. It ought to have some tolerance. So I'm saying 430. Okay, it says that's good. I'm going to go to the explanation. See, they're saying there are about 440, but notice how it took my answer anyway. You know, they said that's about 240. All right, so it's good to know that um, they have a, a nice built-in tolerance, okay? All right, there are three libraries in Tomsville. Each library has both fiction and nonfiction books. The double bar graph below shows how many of each are at each library. So here we have the number of books and here we have the library. So at Central, there are this many fiction and that many nonfiction books, et cetera. So which libraries have more fiction than nonfiction? Just give me the letters. What do you guys think? All right, more fiction. So the green is taller. And that's it, central, or you could type C. And how about the next question? Which libraries have fewer? than 600 fiction books. Yep, Valley does. Whereas these two both have green bars above 600. Estimate the total number of books at Woodside. What do you guys think? Right, so look at the answers are all a little, you know, off. So the total number at Woodside. So remember, we have to add these two together. They're definitely 900 fiction. And then the problem becomes how many of those nonfiction, you know, to me, that looks like it's in the middle. And the difference between there is 300. So the middle, it's going to be 900 plus half of 300 or plus 150. So 900 plus 150 is 1,050. And then adding these two together, I would say 1950.
I'm curious, you know, what else they would take. 1950. Okay, and that's what they said in here. I'm going to go back. Uh, more fiction was central, fewer than 600 was valley. So let's try 2000 and see if they take it. Okay. They sure do. They sure do. Let's try 1900. They'll let me do another one. Um, more fiction. I have to do it every time. Valley. They take 1900 also. So that's encouraging, right? All right. Next are the stem and leaf. All right, so we know how to read this. The key three bar four means 34 dinner orders. The stem and leaf display below gives the number of dinner orders 18 different nights at a restaurant. Use the display to answer the questions that follow. Okay, so what was the least number of order in the 40s, you guys? Least number in the 40s. And the greatest number overall? Seventy-seven. How many nights was the number of orders in the sixties? Yep, we see there are three leaves in the sixties. There's sixty-three, sixty-five, sixty-five. Yep. Okay. So these are all pretty straightforward, right? We're mostly just reading these graphs, making sure we know how to read them. So let us move on to 2.2. And this is on histograms, frequency, polygons, and time series graphs. And so I cut some examples here out of Alex. And we've seen these histograms before where we have a frequency distribution. Frequency, again, means the number of times something happens. So here we have shopping times for 18 shoppers at a grocery store. So one shopper took 31 minutes, another took 21 minutes in the store, et cetera. And then we're grouped using a grouped frequency distribution. So here we count how many shoppers shopped between 14 and a half to 20 and a half minutes. And we can see down here, this is now a number line. Those two bars means, you know, that's not to scale. We're just starting a little ways over from zero. But that's not to scale right there. Um, so there were four in that class. And it says, note that the class width is six. 14 and a half plus six is 20 and a half. And Alex is now taking the convention that when you have a class, you include the lower boundary in this class 
but you don't include the upper boundary. So if someone did shop for 20 and a half minutes, we would count them in this next class here. And to me, that just makes sense because I just think of grades, you know, usually like if you say 70 to 80 is a C, I mean, you don't count 80 as a C, right? If you had an 80%, that would be a B. So it's up to, but not including the endpoints. So like 89.99999 is still a B. And it's not till you get to 90 that it's an A. Okay. All right. So maybe this will help re remember you. It will help you to remember you're including the left but not the right. Um, and for this example, they give you shopping times for 14 shoppers. And then they ask you to draw the histogram. They give you the initial class boundary, 22 and a half. They give you the ending class boundary at 50 and a half, and they want you to create four classes of equal width. And so you take the difference and divide by four. You take the difference in those lengths and divide by four, and that gives you the class width. Okay, it's kind of like if you took a ribbon and you laid it down Let's say you just, you know, you laid it down here to measure it because it was hard to line it up or something, you know, whatever. So what's the length of that ribbon? Let's say these are inches. How long is that ribbon? Right, it's six inches. I mean, if you had to, you could count. One, two, three, four, five, six inches. But we could also say eight minus two. So whenever you take the difference, it gives you the length between those two numbers. And now suppose I said, create three, you know, you're gonna cut the ribbon, cut into three equal pieces. So you take that six and you divide it by three. So you have three equal pieces. One, two, three. So each one is two inches long. Does that make sense? That's literally the same thing we're doing here. I mean, the numbers aren't as nice. This is college. <laughs> this was second grade. This is second grade. This is college, but it's the same exact idea. 50 and a half, 
minus 22 and a half. So that's 28 inches, say, and you're gonna divide it into four equally sized pieces. So you get seven. And yeah, we're gonna do a bunch of examples in Alex. And so notice they say, you know, 22 and a half. That's the first class. Uh, this first class, it includes 22 and a half up to, you're gonna add seven, you go to 29 and a half. And we don't include the upper boundary, not the upper boundary. And then 29 and a half, you're gonna add seven again, add seven again, add seven again. So that's what gives you your classes. And yeah, we're gonna do some of these. And then there are relative frequency histograms. Um, I'm just gonna show you in Alex. So yeah, let's go ahead and do 9313. Okay, so for these, you know, they give you the classes here. Here are the hottest recorded temperatures in Fahrenheit for each of 18 cities throughout North America. And then we wanna count how many had temperatures between 94 and a half and 100.5. So you're just gonna count. And it turns out there are four. So between here and here, right, you can drag that, click and drag up to four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And here they've circled them for you. There are four in that first class, or five in the second class, et cetera etc. And they show you one little bar at a time. <gasps> one bar at a time. And overall, here's all of them on one graph. Okay. So again, I think these are pretty straightforward. 16 shoppers. Here are the shopping times. They've already created the classes for you. The class width is four. Notice 15 and a half plus four gives you 19 and a half. We include the lower, not the upper, but there are no halves anyway. And then, so what's between 15 and a half and 19 and a half? Right, you've got those three. So you can drag that one up. Et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Number 10. All right. So now they're asking you to create, you know, the classes and to draw the histogram. So a sample of 16 participants took part in a hearing experiment. Among other things, the absolute hearing threshold in decibels was measured for each participant. And here are the 16 measurements. Draw the histogram for these data, including an initial class boundary of 17.5 and an ending class boundary of 37.5 and you need five classes of equal width. So notice here, you know, this is one class. That's the second, the third, the fourth. We need five. So this is where you can add another one. Okay. So I went ahead and did that. So we have five, you know, classes spotted there. And the ending class boundary is 
Are you guys okay so far? Any questions? So far, so good. Okay. So now again, you know, it's like the length of the ribbon. It ends at 37.5 and it started at 17.5. So when you subtract that, you get a length of 20 and you're gonna divide that into five equally sized pieces. So each class width will be four. And, you know, feel free to use the calculator, but hopefully we can all do some basic arithmetic. So you're going to add four. Because that's the width here. Right? Add four, add four, add four, add four. If you add four or five times, you would have added 20, and that takes you to 37.5. So you add four, add four, add four, add four. And again, we can see 33 and a half plus four is 37 and a half. And now we need to see the frequencies for all of these 16. Notice there's a button here, send data to calculator. You can send the data, all 16 of these numbers to the calculator and it shows up highlighted. While it's highlighted, you can click sort. And that sorts it in ascending order from smallest to largest, which makes it easier for you to see, you know, how many are between 17 and a half and 21 and a half. There's just one. How many are between 21 and a half and 25 and a half? So 22 and 25 fall in that class, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So you're just counting how many are in each class. Okay. Now in this topic, there are problems that give you the initial and the ending boundaries and how many classes. There are also questions that give you the initial and the class width. And then, you know, you have to make sure you're going to include all the data. Let me see, someone said what I'm speaking about doesn't reflect on the shared screen. Can you guys see this problem okay? Do you guys see the problem I'm working on? Okay, so for the person who said that and all that you're seeing is the example of the ribbon, I recommend um, hold on. It looks like the problem is on your end. I'd log out and come back in. Okay. Because otherwise you're going to miss like the whole lecture. So I'd go ahead and leave and just come right back in. Maybe that'll help. The recording will be good too, but just saying.
All right. Okay. All right, so let's try another one. Um, let's do it, uh, one of the other types, okay? All right. So this one gives you an initial class boundary of 59.5. and a class width of five. And here we have heights and in inches of 19 male adults. Draw the histogram. So we're starting there and we've got a class width of five. And we wanna make sure we're just gonna capture all of the data. All right, so you can keep adding five, four and a half, add five, 69 and a half, Etc. But to make sure the best thing to do is to send the data to the calculator and while it's highlighted, sort it. And so notice the highest data value is 82. So we want to keep going until we're sure 82. Um, is included in a class width. Okay, so we're gonna add five again. If I add five again, now I'm at uh, 79.5, I'm still not up to 82. So you need to add another column. Okay. And now I, I'll be able to get them all. And then again, you want to count how many are between 59 and a half and 64 and a half. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then how many are between 64 and a half and 69 and a half? So just the 67. One. Etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here are lengths of stays for a random sample of 15 patients discharged from a particular hospital. So somebody stayed 13 days, nine days, et cetera, et cetera. An initial class boundary of 2.5 and a class width of three. So you're gonna add three, add three, et cetera. And you just wanna make sure you're gonna capture the biggest number so send to the calculator and sort. You want to be able to capture 13. So you're adding three. Add three. And now 13 will be in here. And again, you're just counting how many are in each class. Okay. 
So three is in the first one and the fives are in the first one. So there are four, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And here's one that gives you an initial and an ending. So the initial is 30.5 and you need five classes. So one, two, three, four, five, and the ending is 60.5. So here's a list of PDE ratios, current stock price divided by companies earnings per share for 21 companies. Draw the histogram, initial class boundary of 30 and a half. You want five classes of equal width. So the length between here and here, just like if it were a ribbon, sixty and a half minus thirty and a half gives you thirty, right? And you're dividing that by five. So the class width is six. So you're just going to keep adding six. 36.5, And then we just want to count how many are in each class, send the data to the calculator and sort etc cetera, etc cetera. okay so in this first class there's 31 35 and 36 there's three you just want to count okay this is good All right, interpreting relative frequency histograms. A professional golfer is shopping for a new brand of golf ball. She likes most of the features of one particular brand, but she wants to make sure that the brand has a desirable spin rate. The rate at which the ball spins on its axis after being struck by a golf club. To test the spin rate of this new brand of ball, the golfer hits the brand of ball on a hundred shots and a computer measures the spin rate for each shot. The computer then produces the following histogram summarizing the 100 spin rates. Okay, so here's frequency. Again, the double hashtag there means that's not to scale. Because otherwise, if that length were 5,000, if you did it again, you'd be at 10,000, right? So it's like, they just condensed it so we don't have to go out that far. And so notice on this axis, we have frequency. And then here's the spin rate in revolutions per minute. These are high. I had no idea it got all spun that quickly. So there were, um, you know, eight between 5,000 and 5,500 revolutions per minute. There were 10 shots that had a spin rate in between there, et cetera, et cetera. So if you added up all these numbers, you'd get the total 100. And then it says, find the proportion that are at least 6,500 revolutions per minute. At least. So, you know, we're starting here and going this way. 
Now it's not saying find the number that had spin rates of at least 6,500. If that were the case, you would just add these. But rather it's asking for the proportion. So you add these and divide by the total. So that's 4758. So 58 percent had at least 6,500 revolutions per minute. And it says write your answer as a decimal and don't round. So 58 over 100 is 58 hundredths. Okay. And so again, remember, we always need to be careful to read these, um, you know, axis labels to make sure here it's frequency as opposed to relative frequency. We try to find them. This one gives us relative frequency. So now instead of straight up numbers like counts, it's giving us the percents, right? 12% were between here and here, 24% between here and here, etc. So Raysburg Corporation is contemplating using a new glue in the construction of its laminated veneer lumber. Of importance to the company is the carrying load of the lumber. The company has tested 25 beams using the new glue, recording for each beam the pressure in pounds per square foot at which the beam broke. The data collected are presented in the following histogram. Okay, so 12% broke with a carrying load between 860 and 880 pounds per square foot. So it's not the count, but the percentage. Okay. And now, questions asking you to find the proportion of carrying loads in the sample that are less than 900. Less than 900. So that's this way. So really, we're just going to add these 12% and 24% are 36%. It's like 12 cents and 24 cents, 36 cents. Okay. So I don't recommend that you just memorize, okay, when it's relative frequency, I just add. And when it's, you know, we always have to understand what's going on. There, we're going to have too many different types of questions to memorize just randomly. If the question asks this, then I do that. You know, we want to understand what does relative frequency mean? What does it mean when you're asked to find a proportion? Right. So just saying. All right. So um, it's 730 straight up. Let's go ahead and take a break and we'll come back at 745. Welcome back. Okay. All right, next up, we're going to talk about shapes of histograms. And there are some words we use here, like peaks, a bar or small group of bars that relative to other bars is or are higher. Like right here, we have a peak. Here we have two peaks. If you have one peak, it's called unimodal. 
just like a unicycle has one wheel. A bicycle has two wheels, bimodal, two modes, or two peaks. Multimodal, three or more peaks. Um, these peaks can also start right at the um, y-axis. So for example, you know, we might have something like this. So this is an example of one also that's bimodal. Right, there's one peak here and another peak here. Okay. And a symmetric histogram is one in which the left half is a mirror image of the right half. So here they've drawn a dotted line down the middle. So you can imagine if that were on paper, if you folded it right on that dotted line, they would match up. So that's symmetric. A uniform histogram is one in which all the bars are the same height. A bell-shaped one looks like a bell. And this is like that like a Liberty Bell, you know, like a Liberty Bell. And then there's a tail, like here, this is a tail off to the left, and we say it is skewed to the left or negatively skewed. And here, there's the tail on the right. We say it's skewed to the right or positively skewed because positive numbers are on the right, negative are on the left. So there's always that kind of orientation. And like it says here, many histograms won't exactly fit one of these descriptions, but we often say, you know, the histogram is roughly uniform form or approximately bell-shaped, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's look at some of these. So what do you guys think? Type in th uh, four letters for me, you know, like A, B, C, A or something. Answering the four questions with which histogram, A, B, or C. Give me four letters. That's okay. Yep, if you want to wait and do all four, put in all four letters. And we've got some disagreements. We've got uh, CBCC, we've got ABCC, we've got BACC. We've got AACC. All right, so unimodal, that means there's one peak. This is the one peak right here. Okay.
Notice histogram A has two peaks. Just saying. Because a lot of you said histogram A for this first part. And then which one is skewed to the right the most? So that means there's a tail on the right. So that's going to be histogram A. And which one is closest to being uniform? That's histogram C. And which one is closest to being symmetric? That's also C. No. You tried to fold that in half. Okay. So it is B A C C. Okay, maybe another one. about this. I'm going to give you one more.
Okay. I think everybody got that one. All right. All right, next up are fre constructing frequency distributions and frequency polygons. Um, so basically, um, we're gonna learn about the difference between a histogram and a frequency polygon. Um, a histogram has bars and a frequency polygon has dots and little line segments. And really for histograms, we have, you know, a class width, a starting and ending boundary and a rectangle. And for these frequency polygons, we have a midpoint. And we put either the cumulative or just the relative frequency above the midpoint. So we're going to look at some of those. And then also we're going to look at ogives. And an ogive, not ogive, but ogive, it's a variation of a relative frequency poly polygon. And it's where we're going to use cumulative relative frequencies instead of just relative frequencies. Okay, so let's just see, let's just see. All right, so here you're asked to draw the frequency polygon. Here are the hottest recorded temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit for each of 15 cities throughout North America. Complete the grouped frequency distribution, and then using the data from part A, draw the frequency polygon. Okay, so first we're just going to count how many are in each class. Note the class width is five. 97 and a half plus five is 102 and a half. 102 and a half plus five is 107 and a half. So I just want to make sure we're understanding like everything. We can send the data to the calculator while it's highlighted, click sort. And again, we're going to count how many are in the first class, how many are in the second class, et cetera. And then we're going to plot. So let's just go step by step here in Alex. There were three in that first class, four in the second class, et cetera, et cetera. And then here they say, what's the difference between a frequency polygon and a histogram? Um, they offer two ways to present the same information. They both summarize a frequency distribution. Obvious difference in display. Frequency polygons have dots and lines. Histograms have rectangles or bars. And the main difference is how the classes are labeled. In a frequency polygon, the classes are usually labeled by their midpoints. In a histogram, the classes are labeled by their endpoints. The lower and upper boundaries are endpoints. Okay, so for each class, we're going to put the frequency over the midpoint. To find the midpoint, you can add the two and divide by two, right? Add the lower and upper endpoints and divide by two. Okay, you can also notice that, you know, again, the class width is five. And so the midpoint is halfway. So that means, you know, you could add 2.5 to the lower or subtract 2.5 
from the upper, which here would be easier, right? If you subtract 2.5 from 102.5, you get 100. You know, doing it this way, you can often come up with the midpoint mentally without doing all these calculations. Right? It's kind of like saying, hey, what's the midpoint between 70 and 80? Right? It's literally the halfway point. We know it's 75, right? Because the total difference is 10, so half of the way is 5. Now, could you add them together and divide by two? Sure. And you still get 75. But I'm just saying, this way is way easier. We just know it's halfway through. So understanding what a midpoint is, it's the halfway mark, will save you some calculations there. So here we go. We've got a frequency of three over the midpoint of 100, a frequency of four over the midpoint of 105, et cetera. Okay. So here's another one, shopping time, 16 shoppers, complete the grouped frequency distribution. Note that the class width is four. So you're gonna sort your data and count how many are between 15 and a half and 19 and a half, four. And how many are between 19 and a half and 23 and a half? So there are two. And all together, this should add up to the 16 shoppers, right? There's six, so there should be 10 more. Between 23 and a half and 27 and a half. So one, two, three, four. between 27 and a half, so we're gonna start at 28, and 31 and a half, so there's just the three. And then from 31 and a half, so starting at 32, there are three. And again, if you count these, you ought to get 16 total. Right, four and two is six, and four is 10, and three and three is 16, okay? So that's a nice little check. And now I want to put the midpoints of each class, and I have one, two, three, four, five classes. And here I only have room for three midpoints, so I'm gonna add two more columns. Okay, the class width is four. So for heaven's sakes, all you got to do is add two to the starting point, right? Or subtract two from the end point, but just add two. Notice between 15 and a half and 19 and a half, you've added four. So to get halfway, you're going to add half of four, which is two. So the midpoint is 17.5, and you've got a frequency of four. Add two, you've got 21.5, frequency of two. Add two, you get 25.5. And the frequency is four. 
add to, you get 29.5. The frequency is three. Add two, you get 33.5. And the frequency is three. Okay. So that's all we're doing on these. Frequency over the midpoints. These are called frequency polygons because it's like we're drawing a polygon with these sides, you know? Okay. And then we're doing draw the ojav, a cumulative frequency polygon. Okay, let's see. Multiple myeloma is a form of cancer. Doctors surmise that the drug thalidomide may extend the lives of those afflicted with multiple myeloma. In an extensive clinical trial, 25 patients diagnosed as having multiple myeloma were treated with thalidomide and the subsequent number of months that each survival was recorded. Suppose that the following histogram summarized the data from these 25 um, patients, right? So three patients survived between zero and 10 months, nine between 10 and 20 months, seven, et cetera, et cetera. If you add all these five numbers up, you'll get the 25. And you can see three and seven is 10, nine and six is 15. So 10 and 15 is the 25. So based on the histogram, draw the ojive. Okay, it's cumulative. So there are no patients who survived less than zero months. So we have a zero there. At 10 months, there were three out of the 25. So three out of 25 um, Oh, okay. We have cumulative frequency. I'm, I need to follow my own advice and make sure I read these axes. Right. I saw the decimals here and I thought it was relative frequency. But no, this is just cumulative frequency. Three patients survived less than 10 months. So we just put a three there. Between 10 and 20, there were another nine. So this is cumulative. Okay, less than 20, you're going to add nine plus three to give you 12. Okay, so this one, it's three plus nine. For the next one, you're going to add seven to it. So 12 plus seven gives you 19. Or you could say just the 12 plus the 7. So the next one, it's going to be 19 plus 4. 19 plus 4 is 23. The next one, it's going to be 23 plus 2. Right. All 25 patients lived less than 50 months. Okay. okay. 
And I'll show you what Alex does. They do a little table, you know, and they've added the cumulative frequencies here. So again, it's 10 up to 20 or just less than 20. So this is another one with cumulative frequency. Let me try one with, okay, cumulative relative frequency. And here they've given you relative frequencies. Sometimes they'll give you just raw frequencies and ask you for cumulative relative frequencies or even vice versa. So we really do have to read the axes, okay? Relative, that's always going to give you a decimal or a percentage. Students at a major university in SoCal are complaining about a serious housing crunch. They're stating that many of the students have to commute too far because there's not enough housing near campus. The university did a study reported in the school newspaper. And this summarizes the commute distances for a sample of 100 students. Right, so 26% commuted between zero and four miles. Right, 26% of 100 is 26 students. So if it were just regular frequency, you would have a 26, a 26, an 18, a 14, right? Because you have a sample of 100, it makes the math really easy. All right, there were none less than zero less than four miles away or 26%. And now add 26% to that and you get 52%. Add 18% to that and you get 70%. Add 14%, you get 84%. Add 11% and you get 95%. And then the last 5%, and it makes sense 100% or one whole is less than 24 miles commute. Okay. So, hey, if you want to do a table and add them all up, you can, but you just keep adding, you know, you start with the first one, add the next one, add the next one, add the next one. You're just adding. But here they show you the adding. <laughs> you could also use the calculator. But I want to encourage you to start if you're not already doing some mental math, you know, our brains are like muscles. If we don't use them, um, they're not going to be very useful anymore. So it's good to practice and do some mental math. Okay, so that's it, my friends, for um, today. On Thursday, we're going to go over 2.3 and 2.4. All right. Have a great night.